All right, let's pray. Father, um, you are Father, you are Son, you are Holy Spirit, and you have invited us in. You've welcomed us into your life, your f- the fullness of your glorious life, and um, we want to know you and enjoy you and uh, love you and delight in you in the way that you ought to be known and loved and delighted in. You've promised to put the love that you have for the Son in us so that we can um, love you in the way we should. And so I pray that you'd help us now as we, as we look at how you relate to this world and what it means for you to be God over this world. Um, would you guide us and direct our minds and our hearts so that they can take it in? We're going we're gonna to be stretched um, because our minds are so small in comparison to you. Um, but we, we, it's good. It's good to be stretched, and it's good to have our hearts and our minds expanded in that way. And so grant us the grace that we need to do it, to endure it, and to come out on the other side um, with our hearts soaring in praise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So in previous sessions, we talked about um, God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and he's invited us into his own divine life. He's He's uh, welcomed us as, his, uh, as the bride of the Son. We are his people, and, uh, and we now share. His knowledge is now in us, um, and his love for himself is in us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. And so now, if, we've, if we think about that's God as he is in himself, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, knowing, loving, and rejoicing in each other. What's his relationship to this world? Why, why move that way? Why move towards a, a world? So this brief you know, a brief jaunt through the Trinity is helpful because it underscores this truth that God is self-sufficient. God is infinitely happy in himself. He has no needs, no wants, no lack. Um, And so, um, and yet, given that he's uh, full in his happiness, he still thinks it's fitting and good that he make a world. And so we just want to explore a little bit in these next two sessions how he relates to the world that he has made. So as we do so, the, the, the title gives away where we're going, but uh, we'll take a little circu- circuitous route to get there. The author and his story, a story is a way of saying something that cannot be said any other way, and it takes every word of the story to say what that means. And so the fact that God has made a world in the form of a story ought to be instructive to us, that we live in a world that is a story. Um, so let's begin this way thinking about creation. What is creation? Well, God created the world ex nihilo, from nothing, and he did so at the point of speech. God created through speech. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Or Psalm 33, 9, he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, it stood firm. So God's speech is what gives reality its reality. And in Romans 4, we're told that he calls things into existence, things that did not exist. He calls things that are not as though they were. John begins his gospel with a Trinitarian account of creation. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And then he goes on to say, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So if if there's a made thing in the universe, it was made by the Word. It was made at the point of speech. But not only did God create the world from nothing, He sustains the world uh, by speech. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. So some people have this idea that God kind of spoke it at the beginning and he wound it up like a clock and kind of just sent it off and it just kind of goes on its own power. That's not the biblical picture. God sustains, he upholds the the world by his mighty and powerful word. Or again, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Without his sustaining power, without that speech, that, that, that word of his power that keeps things together, things would just fall apart. They'd fall back into the nothingness from which they came. This, this means um, if God stopped speaking, you and I would stop being. There, there is no existence apart from God's continual speech. So he doesn't just speak at the beginning, he continues to speak. The reason you're sitting here now, the reason that you're listening to this, the reason I'm speaking this is because God is speaking me. So God creates at the point of speech, he sustains uh, through speech, and this raises this interesting question about then how does, where is God? Where is he speaking from? Is he like on a balcony somewhere speaking out and there's the world kind of hanging in the middle of nothing? Where does he in relation to the world? Well, sometimes we talk, Bible talks, that God's in heaven. 
or he's high, he's lifted up. That's a biblical image. He's, but at the same time, he's not far from any of us. Acts 17, 27. Um, but Psalm 139 gives a very, very uh, succinct, concise answer to this question. Where is God? Where is he? Well, the psalmist says, where shall I go from your spirit? Where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you're there. If I go up to heaven, is God there? Yes. Well, what if I go down? What if I make my bed in Sheol? Well, you're there too. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. No matter how high you go, no matter how low you go, no matter how far you go, God is present. And if we take with what we saw earlier, he sustains his speech. He's present and speaking. He's present and active. Edwards captures this, um, God, the extent of God's presence and activity in the world in a beautiful sermon called God is Everywhere Present. Here's what he says. God is present everywhere. Any other thing is only so by his operation and influence. God is in the continual exercise of his infinite power and wisdom throughout all of creation. Every moment takes a continual act of infinite power to uphold things in being. He goes on to say, with respect to ourselves, it is because God is in us, God is speaking us, that our blood runs, our pulse beats, our lungs play, our food digests, our organs of sense perform their function. When we look at the sun, the moon, the stars above, look upon the earth, the things below, if we look at the stones or under them, we see infinite power now in exercise at that place. If we look upon ourselves, we see our hands and our feet these members have existence now because God is there and by an act of infinite power upholds them. God is not only everywhere, he is everywhere working. He is everywhere speaking. So this means uh, God speaks things into existence, he sustains things by existence, and he's everywhere present. Now that raises some questions, right? If, he's, if I'm standing here speaking to you, but he is speaking me into existence, how does my action relate to his actions? Um, which is the question that many have related to God's sovereignty and human freedom, God's sovereignty and human responsibility. How can, can this, this image that we have of God speaking the world at every point and being present in the world at every point help us as we think about God's sovereignty and human responsibility? So let's get the, the players on the table first and see the two sides that often... Uh, uh, we, we argue about, we think about, we wrestle with. Um, on, the, on the one side, we have the absolute sovereignty of God. Um, here's what the Bible teaches. Our God is in the heaven. He does all that he pleases. So he, wants to, he pleases something, he can do it. Nothing can stop him from doing what he pleases. He works all things, not just some things, according to the counsel of his will. So God has um, a counsel. He's got um, a plan. He's got purposes. And everything that happens, happens in accordance with that counsel. Nothing happens if it's not according to the counsel of his will. Or in Job 42 too, after Job has wrestled with God and God has appeared in the whirlwind and kicked the door down and knocked him on his face, Job confesses in worship, no purpose of yours can be thwarted. No one can stop you. No one can stand in your way. God is sovereign. Or again, he does according to his will, okay, that's important, to his will among the host of heaven, that's angels, and among the inhabitants of the earth. So in heaven and on earth, he does according to his will, and this is so key, none in heaven or on earth can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? No, if God's hand's going to come down, no one says, no, you can't do that. No one gets in the way and successfully stops him. When he Purpose is something, it comes to pass. As Isaiah 46, 9 says, He is God, there's no other. He is God, there's none like Him. What does that mean? What does it mean for Him to be God? How is He unique? Well, He's unique because His counsel will stand. He will accomplish all His purpose. No purpose falls to the ground. No purpose fails. All of His purposes are accomplished because He's God and there is no other. So we see this... Um, Pervasively in the Bible, God is absolutely, universally, exhaustively sovereign over all things. And that's not just uh, at the general level. It's not just kind of generic sovereignty. It's specific. It, in, it extends to the weather. He sends the lightning. He sends the, 
the storms, the establishment of governments. All authorities exist were instituted by God, Paul says in Romans 4, uh, 13. The appearance of the stars, there he calls them out by name every night. Every night, every star is named by God and called out to take its place in the great dance. Falling of sparrows, so not just heavenly bodies up in, up in heavens, but sparrows. Jesus says, not a sparrow falls to the ground apart from your father. So, Big things, small things, sparrows, life and death of all men. God says, I kill, I make alive. I kill, I make alive. Deuteronomy 32, 39. The location of civilizations. It says that he establishes the boundaries of the people, the the place of their habitation. So we we live where we live because God has established that's where you will live. You were born into the family you were born into because God said that's the family. He determined that. The decisions of rulers, the king's heart is like a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wills. Just like this. He just turns his hand back and forth. Okay. So the king's mind, his, the, the, the thoughts that he has are determined, are guided, are governed, are steered by God, according to Proverbs 21, verse 1. Or all human beings. The mind of a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So you have plans, but the steps you actually take are determined by not ultimately by you, but by God. Proverbs nineteen twenty one, And then these amazing passages like in Genesis 20 where Abimelech takes Sarah into his uh, harem but does not consummate this uh, marriage, this false marriage. And um, God says to Abimelech, I kept you from sinning against me. So even the, the sinful actions of this king, God prevented them because he has the power to prevent sin or not as in Acts 4.27, where it says that the rulers of the Gentiles, the Jewish leaders, Pilate and the rest, were all gathered together against your holy servant Jesus to do whatever your hand and your plan predestined to take place. So the hand of God and the plan of God, the hand of God and the plan of God determined what would take place through the sinful actions of these men. They were sinning. They were Great wickedness against the Son of God, and yet it was God's hand and God's plan that stood behind it. Now We'll talk about how does that work maybe in a minute, but for now we just want to see it's there. We have to deal with it. This is what the Bible teaches. So, the Scriptures make it clear from Genesis to Revelation, from top to bottom, front to back, high and low, God rules, God reigns, God governs, God ordains all things. But the Scripture teaches more than this. It teaches... Not only is God sovereign, but you are really responsible for your actions. The Bible assumes that our choices are real and meaningful. Joshua says, choose this day whom you will serve. You can choose it. You're going to worship God, you're going to worship idols. It assumes that you have that capacity, that ability to choose it, that your your response matters, your obedience to that command matters. It teaches that God's going to judge us for our actions, 2 Corinthians 5, and for our words, including our careless ones. Every careless word. You'll give an account for every careless word you speak, Jesus says in Matthew 12. So if, you're, if he's going to judge you for your actions, that assumes you're responsible for your actions. God issues commands, exhortations, warnings, like the Ten Commandments. And that implies that we have some capacity to respond to them, to obey them, if we choose to do so. Now, we may be so sinful that we can't choose to do so. Our, our desires can be so warped, but he assumes your choice really matters here. Whether or not you have other gods before me, whether or not you commit adultery, whether or not you steal or covet, that's in some capacity in your, in your power. You will be held accountable for doing or not doing that thing. So we have real responsibility. Or the Bible teaches our actions are instrumental and necessary in the completion of God's purposes. How will they hear Meaning, how will people hear the gospel without a preacher? Okay. There must be a preacher if they're to hear the gospel. Which means you going to preach to them is a necessary means to them hearing and responding to the gospel. So your actions are necessary and instrumental in bringing about God's purposes to get the gospel to the nations. So, your, it's not like your choices don't matter. Like, oh, God will do it some other way. No, you, it matters because how will they hear without a preacher? You've got to go. Somebody's got to go. The Bible teaches that answered prayer depends in some measure 
on our asking with the right motives. So, you have not because God ordained that you wouldn't have, because God's sovereign. You have not because, James says, you ask not. Why do you lack? Why do you not have? Because you don't ask. And he goes on to say, and when you do ask, you ask with wrong motives so that you can spend it on your pleasures. So, asking is a prerequisite to receiving in the Bible, in many cases. So your actions really matter. If you want to receive, you have to ask with right motives. Or Luke 18, 8, 1 through 8, God responds to the persistent prayers of his people. The persistent widow, she's just knocking, just keep pleading for justice, pleading for justice, and then Jesus says, if the unjust judge gives her justice because she keeps knocking, won't God give you what you ask for if you keep asking, if you keep asking? Which means... If you don't keep asking, you won't receive. If you don't keep seeking, you won't find. If you don't knock, the door will not be opened. So everyone, so there's this assumption that you must do something. Your actions really matter. And this is why we feel this tension, or at least we think we, we should feel this tension between God rules, God reigns, God ordains everything, and that your actions are true and meaningful. So, the scriptures teach that we're true moral agents. We make real decisions. They have real effects on the world and we'll be held accountable for them. So those are the two sides. Now, before we turn to like, how does that fit together? Um, it's important that you, under, you underline one key point here. The Bible is not bothered by these two things at all. There's no, um, the Bible doesn't ever seem to think this is a problem, which we, we think this is a problem. We wrestle with it and that's okay. But it's not a problem that the biblical authors are very concerned about. They just teach, on the one hand, God ordains everything, and on the other hand, you're responsible for everything you do. And they just let it stand there. So uh, Spurgeon has a great quote where somebody once asked him, you know, Spurgeon, how do you reconcile the sovereignty of God with human freedom or human responsibility? And he said, uh, I never try to reconcile friends. Okay. Right. You, don't, you don't try to reconcile people who already get along, and they get along because they're both in the Bible. You reconcile enemies. So uh, I think that's a good attitude to have. But having, having said that, I think the Bible does give us certain hints about how we can think about this, how we can think about how God's sovereign actions relate to our true responsibility in the world. And this is an analogy. It's not original to me. I picked it up over the years. I've heard multiple people use it, but I found it particularly helpful in thinking through this issue. So here, here it is. God is an author. This world is his story. We are his characters. This is an analogy. It's a model. It's an image. But just let's, let's work with it and just see if it's helpful in thinking through this, this tension. God is an author. The world is his story. We are his characters. Is it in the Bible? Well, I think a strong hint in this direction, at least, is Psalm 139, verse 20. All the days ordained for me, so there's sovereignty, there's God ordaining things, were written in a book when as yet there were none of them. So, so just, this is where I get it. What do you call someone who writes about someone else's days in a book? That's an author. An author writes things in a book about other people. And so that's, God is the author. He's writing in a book. Uh, he's writing a story, and there's characters. There's me. All the days ordained for me were written in that book when, before they happened. Now, if you take that passage and you combine it with what we said earlier about God creates the, and sustains by speech, maybe we could say something like this. First, God writes the book of history, he writes it down, okay. when as yet there were none of them. He writes the book down, and then he reads it aloud into existence. So he writes the book down, all the days ordained were written in a book, and then he, he pulls out the book and he reads it into existence. He speaks it into existence. So he puts pen to paper, he forms this plan for the ages, he, he comes up with his glorious plan, and then he performs a dramatic rendering of his epic poem. He just, he gives a rendering of it that's so potent, it, his words, his words are so powerful that they don't just stay words. My words are just words. His words are people. His words are us. His, his word is so, he has reality causing power, and it causes us to exist when he speaks us into existence. And that's, I think, very helpful to think then how, how does his sovereignty relate to our responsibility? Well, how does an author's sovereignty over his story relate to his characters? Well, tease out the analogy with me a, a bit. Um, we'll use C.S. Lewis. 
uh, and Narnia as an example. So just think about how there's this layering that happens in this analogy. Why was it always winter and never Christmas in Narnia? Okay. Why was it always winter and never Christmas in Narnia? Because the white witch enslaved the land. That's one answer. But you could ask the question from another angle and say, well, why was it always winter and never Christmas in Narnia? Because that's the way Lewis wrote the story. And if you think about it that way, there's really no conflict. Those aren't, it's not like, well, how do we reconcile those? Well, you don't reconcile them exactly. They're just both true. They're, they're true answers to that question. Why does Aslan have to die? Edmund was a traitor. That's the level of the story. But why does Aslan have to die? Because Lewis wrote the story that way. Well, who killed the white witch? Aslan did. Level of the story. Well, but who killed the white witch? Well, C.S. Lewis did. He wrote the story. So every aspect of, the, of that story, of the, of the, the uh, Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, plot, characters, background details, all of it under the sovereign control of C.S. Lewis. He runs it all. He ordains it all. And yet, the actions of the characters, the White Witch, Edmund, Aslan, all of them are necessary for the resolution of the plot. They're real. They matter. Without them, there is no story. Without them, there is no plot. Without them, there is no grand, glorious story that enriches so many of us. They have, to, they have to be there, but they're only there because C.S. Lewis invented them and guided them and governed them. Now, when you give this, an, this analogy, um, you sometimes, I, I've given it, I found it very fruitful. I think it helps. It helps me tremendously. Um, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't solve everything. It creates more mystery, like, well, how exactly does it work? I don't know. I can't solve every question or anything like that, but it helps me to at least get a picture. Like, I do see in this analogy, like when I think about authors and characters, I go, yeah, that makes sense there. So maybe it's something like that with God. Um, but people inevitably raise an objection. Um, actually, well, before I get to the objection, uh, Lewis actually pointed out that this is the way he thought about the world. He says, uh, my point is that if God does exist, he is related to the universe more as an author is related to a play than as one object in the universe is related to another. And he said that after the Russian cosmonauts went up in their space shuttle and they came back and they said, God doesn't exist, and we know because we went up and looked. Right? And he said, that's ridiculous. That's like, that's like Hamlet going up into the attic and concluding, Shakespeare doesn't exist, he wasn't up there. Right? That's, not, that's not the kind of relationship that Shakespeare and Hamlet have. Right? Shakespeare and Hamlet operate on totally different levels of reality because one's an author and one's a character. And, Lewis went on to say, if Shakespeare and Hamlet are ever going to have a conversation, all of the initiative will be on Shakespeare's side which is exactly what we find in reality. If, if we're to know God, he must reveal himself to us. Well, here's the objection that often comes up. We are more real than the Pevensies, meaning Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy from Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. We're more real than they are. They're fictions. They're not, they don't, uh, if, if, if it's right to think that way in terms of degrees of reality, like we have this sense like they're just characters in a book. They're not real, but I'm real. So, um, okay, let's just think about that. Um, I think that's, that's true, like, that we are more real than the Pevensies. But, but, God is more real than C.S. Lewis. If we're going to compare realities here, yes, we've got fictions compared to real people, but the distance between real people, finite, limited creature like C.S. Lewis, and God is infinite. That's an infinite gap. If we're going to talk about where the analogy breaks down, it doesn't break down between us and the characters, right? That's actually closer than the distance between God and creation. And the fact that it's, that's where the distance is means um, God has creative power. His, he's powerful enough to make his fictions real. That's the kind of power. When he invents a world, it's a real world. When, when I invent a world, it's a fictional world. It's just a, a phantasm. It's just, it's make-believe. When God invents a world, it's real. It has substance. He speaks it and it exists. So it's because of God's infinite reality-causing power that I think, despite that objection, the analogy still works. It's still helpful. Um, and I think, it help, I think the analogy helps explain some biblical passages that can puzzle us, like this one. Um, who's responsible for Joseph, meaning Old Testament Joseph, son of Jacob, his suffering? Well, if you think about that story, his brothers are envious and sent, sell him into slavery. Then he's in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar's wife accuses him of attacking her, and he gets thrown into prison. And then the uh, cupbearer and the baker forget about him, and 
So uh, again and again, he's just, all sorts of bad things are happening because other people are wronging him. His brothers, Pharaoh, or Potiphar, Pharaoh, all of them are, are wronging him. So who's responsible for his suffering? Well, all of those people are. But when Joseph gets asked, when Joseph at the end of his life is confronted by his brothers and they say, don't, hurt, don't kill us because we know that you know, we were wrong, he says, look, look I'm, not gonna, I'm not in the place of God. I'm not in the place of God. He says, you meant evil against me. So notice that you meant something. You had an intention. That's one level of intention. Okay? But God meant, it's another level of intention, it for good. So you meant evil against me, God meant it for good. The interesting thing here uh, is you push into the, the original language, into the Hebrew a little bit. This is, I think, a point everybody can grasp. Um, this it right here, what's that referred to? Well, in Hebrew, pronouns are, nouns are gendered, meaning just like in Spanish, um, nouns are gendered. I mean, they're feminine nouns, there's masculine nouns. And so this is a feminine pronoun, which means... Pronoun substitutes for noun, which means, okay, let's go back in the sentence and find out what it's standing in for. Like, w- grammatically, what's, what is it replacing? And say, okay, was there a feminine noun earlier in the sentence? And there is. There's one. It's this word right here. Evil. It's feminine noun. Ra'a. So if you replace the pronoun with the noun, okay, if you take out the it and you put in what it's standing for, you get this. You meant evil against me, but God meant evil evil for good. So layers of causality. There's horizontal character level uh, causality and purposes, and then there's divine authorial levels of purpose. You meant evil, God meant it for good. That's author and story. That's character level, that's author level. Or what about this one? Who's responsible for Job's misery? Well, Satan, he, everything gets put in his hand. Satan strikes him with boils. Satan goes out and has his way with him. God God does that, so Satan's responsible. The Chaldeans take his oxen. The Sabaeans take his camels. Fire falls from heaven and consumes his flocks, and a great wind knocks over the house with his kids in it. So Satan, who's responsible? Satan is. Chaldeans are. Sabaeans are natural disasters. But you ask Job, why'd this happen? Who did this to you? And without sinning, he says, the Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Which means, two layers again. You've got this layer, Level one, that's character level. Within the story, what's causing it? Well, that band of raiders who just came down from the hills, they did it. Satan, this invisible uh, and evil being, he did it. That fire that fell from heaven, that did it. That big tornado, that did it. That's what caused all of this. You ask Job, who did it? The author. It's the same thing. It's the exact same thing as saying, who killed the white witch? Aslan did. Who killed the white witch? C.S. Lewis did. Who caused Job's misery? Satan did. Who caused Job's misery? The Lord has taken away. So we get these layers. This analogy for me helps to explain these passages where you get this dual layered causality. And and, uh, and the thing about this is, is that God is able to somehow, this is all evil stuff. When Satan does this, this is evil to attack Job in this way. The Chaldeans and Sabaeans, they're, they're thieves. They kill servants. They're murderers, and they're thieves. That's evil. And God can ordain evil, can take away, without himself being evil. And if you put it in authorial terms, that actually help, that's actually helpful. Like, no one, no one reads a uh, line in the witch in the wardrobe and thinks, oh, that white witch, she's so evil. Gosh, C- C.S. Lewis is an awful person for putting her in the story, right? No one thinks, no, the, um, God can ordain that evil exists, just like Tolkien can ordain that evil exists in Middle Earth without being tainted by the evil. Like no one, no one gets mad at Tolkien because Sauron is running around Middle Earth or because Sauron betrays um, the people or because the Nazgul are these really you know, wicked dead guys that fly around on dragons. Like no one's like, oh, Tolkien, right? He, he's not tainted by their corruption and yet he controls all of them. He directs all of them. He ordains that they do what they do including they get destroyed in the end. That's what makes him a good author. So um, this is where that distinction I mentioned earlier about perichoresis, that idea that one thing can dwell in another thing and they don't cancel each other out. So like father is the son, in the son, son's in the father, but they're not identical. This is another place where it can be helpful. Like um, God 
can cause something. God's intentions can exist alongside and in human intentions without canceling each other out. The human intentions are real, so are the divine ones. The authorial intentions are real, so are the characters. They, they exist together. They're not competing. You don't have to deny one in order to affirm the other. So the author is the author, the characters are the characters, but the characters, all their thoughts, intentions, and actions are the result of God's, of the author's creative will. Now, um, some people don't find this analogy all that helpful. They're just, it doesn't do it for them. It doesn't illuminate. They just get, they struggle with it. And uh, I think that's okay. Um, if it doesn't help you, well, that, that's fine. It's an analogy. It helps some, it doesn't help others. Um, but if you feel that way, if you feel like this, that doesn't really do it, I still don't think that that explains how God relates to the world or that, that doesn't seem fair to me or something like that. Let me just make a larger point about how you do theology, how you, how you do faithful theology from the Bible. Because um, over the years as I've wrestled through different biblical things or taught or, or so forth, I've noticed that being faithful to the scriptures often requires me to be stretched in ways I didn't expect. Like my mind needs to be stretched. My heart needs to be expanded. I have, to, I have, I have a theological framework, and it's got to be co- sort of torn down and rebuilt. And um, this, is, this is the way it feels. It feels like a stretching. It feels like I've got one biblical truth over here that pulls me one direction, and I've got another biblical truth over here, and it pulls me another direction, and it's just, it just hurts. Just, that's not, it's not holding together. And, uh, and I've had that happen enough that I started to think this is part of the design. This is what God's doing. This is why he reveals things in the way he does. Faithfulness to the Bible stretches our hearts and minds. That's what he's doing. So think about some examples. Um, God is one. We saw this one earlier. God is three. God is one. God is three. That, okay, how does that hold together? That's mysterious. That's paradox. But it's not going to do any good to say, well, he's only one. If you do that, you're a Muslim. There's one God, that's it, and there's no, no, no trinity. You do the other one, he's just three, he's not one. Well, you're a polytheist. So you, you can't do either one. You've got to say he is one and he's three, and I'm just going to hold that, even if I don't fully understand how that's possible. Or Jesus Christ is fully God, Jesus Christ is fully man. How is that possible? How is the fullness of deity dwell bodily? I don't know, but they're in my Bible, and I'm not going to let one go in order to believe the other. God is transcendent, he's high and lifted up. He's near to me. He's close at hand. Pulled in opposite directions. He's, Jesus is a lion. Jesus is a lamb. Pulled in opposite directions. And, and so this is true at the theological level. It's also true at the experiential level, right? We are called as Christians to weep with those who weep and to rejoice with those who rejoice. That, that hurts. How do you do both? How do you really obey both those commands? And then here, of course, we see God is sovereign over our actions. We are responsible for our actions. Just get pulled. Just get pulled. So don't, this is, this is how God does. This is the way of the cross. You just get pulled in opposite directions. And the whole point is that God intends to um, uh, destroy false views of himself, pitiful little frameworks. We want, we want him, it's, it's like, um, I've called it here, crucifying the old man, maturing the new man. The old man, the old way of thinking, you're, you're um, in, uh, Augustine has a great phrase, he says that God reveals these mysteries, these paradoxes, like sovereignty and responsibility, like the Trinity. Why does he do it? In order to wear Adam down so that the glorious light of Christ can shine through. So God wants to wear Adam down. He wants you to crucify the old man. He wants that part of you to die, the part that says, no, that can't be. God can't dwell in a human body. God can't be human. He wants to say, yeah, that's, you think that's foolish? Right? That's what the Greeks thought. That's foolishness. Um, that's what the Jews thought. That's why they crucified him. They thought that's blasphemous. Okay? That's, that part of you needs to die, and then something else needs to be reborn and then matured and grown up and stretched and enlarged and expanded. This is what God is doing through these truths. So don't resist that. Don't say, well, it's hard, so I'm just going to let them both go or let one go or the other go. Don't use one part of the Bible to mute another part of the Bible. Don't cancel one part of the Bible with another part of the Bible. And, and don't get frustrated if your mind aches. You just, you just can't get it. It doesn't fit. That's the point. We're talking about God. We're talking about an infinite God and finite creatures. What would you expect? 
I'd be more skeptical, actually, if it fit in nice, neat little boxes. I'd feel like, yeah, human beings can invent that. But a God who is sovereign over everything, and yet my actions really matter, that's something that hurts. That's bigger than my mind can contain. So expect, as you come to the Bible, have your categories blown, your mind stretched, your heart expanded so that you can take more of them in. So that's a little side point about how we do faithful, faithful biblical theology. So now, I want to wrap up with uh, some reflections on the problem of evil. Um, before I do that, actually, wh- one of the things the author story analogy does for me, is it helpful, is it shows God's attention to detail, okay? Because if you think about the levels of detail, what that actually means, that everything in reality is under his control, there's an amazing level of detail. Like, every corner of the universe, he's speaking into existence because it matters. He's got purposes and intentions. So, um, I've had this experience. It's a total theological nerd thing to do, but you're just walking down the street and you see like a leaf blow across. And you think, why is that there? Because God's speaking it right there. Because there's no, um, there's no aspect of this setting that is too small for his attention. He's not, just, he's not content with sort of like, yeah, and I'll just, have some, I'll just throw some colors over there. They won't notice. He thinks, I've got to nail it down to the atomic level. Every atom in its place. Every, there are no wayward snowflakes, no rogue atoms, nothing's flying off like, ah, I don't really know how that's going to work. Hope it. It's not like you leave a room and then the set falls down, like in some movie sets. Everything retains its integrity because God continues to speak it into existence. You may not know what the purpose is of everything, but you know that there is one. You know that the author is intentional. So I've, I've done this. I'd encourage you to do this too. Um, I've sometimes been driving and I'm coming up to an intersection stoplight and I'm sitting there and I'm just and I just start trying to think about all of the people in the cars that are passing me. You got cars going this way, you got cars going that way, cars coming, cars behind you, and I, and I start thinking there's somebody in that car and they're a character and they have a backstory and a future. They will live forever. They came from somewhere, they have parents. And that they, there, there goes one in that car and then one in that car and then one in that car and then one in this car. And you just start just trying to track it just for a second. One in, and it's just, it's amazing to think about the swirl of stories, one intersection on one afternoon in one city, in one country, on one little globe is just mind blowing. I don't have capacity, like I lose it, okay? I've only got room for about three or four stories to imagine, right? Maybe that person's going to work, that person's coming home from work, they're taking their kids to school, and then it's just, I, I lost them. But God marks every one of them. Every last one of them, he's tracking it. They've got a backstory, they've got a future, and he knows it. He's guiding it, he's governing it. He knows every story because he wrote every story. All the days ordained were written in the book. And not just the human ones, right? Like that's, He knows all of those stories at the intersection, including like the squirrels that are chasing each other in the backyard. He knows those stories too. He, they have backstories and they have futures. The ant stories, he knows those stories too. He knows all of the stories. He Every story intersects with every other one, and so he weave, he's weaving them all together. He's not like those producers who make TV shows that just kind of die, right? Like, just, oh, we don't know where this is going to go, and then they get canceled. God didn't write that kind of story. He wrote a story that's going to all weave together and come to a dramatic climax in the end, and every other story, every story will matter, big and small. So you've got to think that there's layers to this, right? You've got a story. That's the top-level master story. That's history of redemption, Creation, fall, redemption. That's, that's one level of the story. Then you've got B stories about nations and kingdoms and Babylons and Egypt. You've got C stories about tribes and villages and clans and families. You've got D stories about brave boys, terrible dragons, petty bullies, cowards, giants, princesses, backbench soccer players, honor students. You've got those kind of stories. And then you've got E, F, and G stories. That's um, animals, vegetables, minerals, lions, tigers, bears, Stars in their wars. Like in the Bible, there's, this, there's these amazing little tidbits where the stars in their courses fought against Sisera, Canaanite general. And you go, there's a story there. Like Israel's fighting Canaan in the book of Judges. And then as they sang, the stars are fighting against the Canaanites. And you're going, I want to know that story. What do you mean the stars were fighting against the Canaanite general? Or with, um, in... Uh, in the book of Daniel, um, there's this, that great one where Daniel prays and says, God, send help. And like two weeks later, an angel shows up. And he's like, sorry, God sent me like two weeks ago, but I got hung up. The prince of Persia got in my way. 
and you're like, details. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, you know, if I'm Daniel, I'm like, forget whatever I call. I just want to hear about this. You talk, right? Tell me about what, well, how, what do you mean the Prince of Persia? Well, that's, there's stories like that. And all of them fit together. All of, all of these stories weave together. So um, we notice if we, if we think this way about the world, um, God is the author. We're, this is his story and we're his characters. He's massively concerned with detail. Next thing it does, though, is with the problem of evil because um, I think it helps, it helps me anyway, to see the problem of evil as narrative tension. Why is there evil in God's world? For the same reason that there's evil in every good story you've ever read. Right? Why is there conflict? Because that's what makes a good story a good story. Um, what God ordains evil for the same reason that Lewis created the White Witch, the same reason that Tolkien made Sauron, the same reason that Rowling created Lord Voldemort. Why? So that good can triumph. The White Witch exists so Aslan has someone to conquer. Evil exists so that good can triumph. Death exists so it can be thrown into hell. The devil exists so that he can be crushed. That's why evil exists. And uh, this doesn't in any way minimize how evil evil is. It actually puts it in its context. And I've been helped, um, so the author story thing means that you can view the story from the author's perspective, like you can or at least know that there is an author's perspective, like that somehow, yes, that's evil, but in the end, it's going to come back around and there will be justice done. You can know that that's true, and then you can get down in the story where the characters are, where we are, and you can really weep, because in chapter three, when that character dies, it's really sad. So we got two lenses. We got a narrow lens, which gets us into the character level, and we, we look at that and we say it's horrible. And the Bible does this. The Bible says, um, if you think because God ordains everything, it's not really evil. Evil is just an illusion. It's not really evil. The Bible just doesn't let you do that. The Bible says evil is evil. You meant evil against me. Joseph believes God did it, and he doesn't shrink back from calling that evil. Or calamity is calamity in the Bible. Or disaster is disaster. Um, and what's more, the Bible tells us, weep with those who weep. So the fact that God ordains all things, including Job's misery, it was still good that his friends showed up and just said, we're going to cry with you for seven days before we say anything. That was, they were doing well at that point. That's exactly what they ought to have done, knowing that God was the one who did it ultimately, that the Lord gave or takes away. So this enables us to, we, we look at that, that lens and we say, I can weep, I can fight, right? So the fact that you know that there's an author guiding everything to a glorious conclusion doesn't mean that you are passive. There's evil, resist it in your own heart and in the world. But knowing that there's an authorial perspective, a wide lens, it means that you can trust that nothing happens apart from the good author's intentions. So we don't stop reading means when that, when that bad stuff happens, you don't just shut the book. You keep going. This is, this is going someplace. Um, Judas' betrayal will be put right. You believe that. You may not know what it is. It may be Saturday, and Jesus is in the tomb, and you're going, I don't know why Judas did that. I don't know how God let this happen. But you believe. He's good. He's wise. He knows what he's doing. And you press in. So you believe that this is a happily ever after kind of story. This is a fairy tale. We live in a fairy tale. We live in a fairy tale where dragons get killed, where tears are wiped away, where there's happily ever after, where faithful death always leads to resurrection. Always. Sorrow lasts for the night. Joy comes in the morning. So that's what we see, problem of evil. Now, one last thing. I've said this is an analogy, and one of the great things about analogies like this is that God has his way of shattering them. Um. So I want you to think with me about three different ways, or th here are just two different ways, and then I'll add the third in a minute, that God reveals himself to us in the Bible. First, um, so I'm going from here from Exodus, where God is talking to Moses, and Moses says, if I go to the people, who do I say sent me? And God says this. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say to, this, the, say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, um, I think that when God says, I am who I am, one of the things he is stressing is that he is the self-existent one. He is God. Meaning, he does not depend on anybody else 
to be who he is. You and me, on the other hand, well, Paul prays, by the grace of God, I am what I am. So I, why, why am I what I am? Because God's grace. Because God's grace. He defines me. I'm dependent upon him. God's case. What about him? No, no, no. I am who I am. Who are you? I just am. There's nothing behind me. There's no, nobody else is determining who I am. So when God says I am who I am, he's emphasizing God is God. God is God. There's none like him. Now, he goes on and he says, God also said to Moses, say to this the people of Israel, Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. And I have a friend who's a Hebrew professor um, who argues, and I'm persuaded this way, that this word Yahweh is built off the um, causative form of the verb to be. Now, let me just explain what that means. In, in Hebrew, if you want to say that someone causes something to happen, you put it in a particular form. So, for example, if you wanted to say, I smash, you would take the word break to break, and you would put it in the causative form, meaning I cause to break, meaning I smash. Does that make sense? So if you want to say, I cause something to happen, you put it in this particular form. It's called the hiffel. That's the technical name, the Hebrew name for it. So you put it in the hiffel. You put it in this causative form. And he argues, based on some grammatical reasons, that this word, Yahweh, is built on the causative form of the verb to be, which never actually shows up in any other way. And the reason is, well, no one else causes things to be. God is the only one who ultimately causes things to exist. So he interprets this name Yahweh to mean the causer of all things to be that are, or causer of all things for short. So who is God? He's the causer of all things. Now, just run with me for a second on that. If it's true that Yahweh means God is the causer of all things, what do we call someone who is the causer of all things in relation to a sequence of events with a beginning, a middle, and an end, and characters? That's an author. C.S. Lewis is Yahweh in relation to Narnia. Tolkien is Yahweh in relation to Middle Earth. Uh, Rowling is Yahweh in relation to Harry Potter. Okay? They are the causer of all things in relation to those worlds. Does that make sense? So if when God says, I am who I am, he's saying, I'm God, I don't depend on anything else. That's like saying C.S. Lewis exists whether or not he ever writes Narnia or not. He's just a guy. Right? He's a professor of, of Renaissance literature. Whether, so he's not dependent upon Narnia for his existence. But once he makes Narnia, what is he? Well, he's the causer of all things in Narnia. If he introduced himself to a Narnian, they'd be like, oh, you're the causer of all things. You're the author. So we've got God is God. We've got God is author. Now, here's the, so that makes sense. That's like God is Trinitarian. He's Father, Son, Holy Spirit, has no needs, no wants, no lacks. That's this. And then you've got God is the author. He makes a world. He speaks it into existence. And he's the author of the story. Now, Here's, here's where the, that's good, that's what we've been talking about. Here's where God shatters it. Um, how do you know that God is God and that God is the author? Well, you only know it. You only know it because that burning bush over there is talking to you. You only know it because God reveals himself as a character. God is a, he reveals himself as a character within the story. So he's not just God, independent, self-existent. He's not just the author, high and lifted up, outside the story, determining everything within the story. He's a character within the story. He's, he speaks to Abraham at Mount Moriah. He leads Israel through the wilderness as a pillar of cloud and fire. He makes his presence dwell in Jerusalem. Where is God? He's over there in that building. Okay. So he's a character within the story. And that, that means that you can view God's relationship to the world in two different ways. On the one hand, he's the author. He's like, um, it'd be like he's standing up there on the, on the perch and he's looking down on the whole thing. History's like this river and he can see all the river at once. He's the author. Uh, he ordains all that. I can see all the twists and the turns. On the other hand, if he's a character, he's down in the story. He's riding the rapids with us. Hands waving wildly in the air, perhaps, right? This, this means... Um, God doesn't merely survey the river. He, he gets down. This is the God who weeps. Like He gets down in the story and he weeps with us. He cries with us when bad things 
happen. He repents. He says, I repent that I made Saul king. I repent that I made man on earth. He changes his mind. I won't destroy Nineveh. Why? Because he's a character within the story. He, he gets in arguments with his prophets. Like, I'm going to go destroy those people. And, the, and Moses is like, you can't. You have made a promise. Okay, then I won't. Okay? Like, what is that? What is this interaction? He's a character, and you can talk to him like he's another character. In fact, that's the only way you can know him is he reveals himself to you as a character within the story. And then, and then, glory of glory, he, he doesn't just stay as a generic character, as a pillar of cloud or a glory cloud in a temple. He becomes a human character, right? He's unchanging and he becomes flesh and dwells among us. And this is what the incarnation is all about. It's about the author of the story becoming the hero of the story. He, he authors it and he comes in as the hero to save the day to rescue the people, to kill the dragon, to get the girl. So this is the picture we have of God, this the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then they speak this world into existence, and they sustain it, and they're the author, and then they see, the Father sends the Son into the world as the main character to do the great work at the heart of the story. This is the picture we get in the Bible, and it's absolutely glorious. Let's pray. Father, I'm so grateful that you show us yourself in all of these ways, that you reveal yourself in your word and you stretch and expand our minds. And I'm, I'm not ignorant that I've, I haven't answered all the questions. I've created more questions. This is um, th this analogy, this, this way of reading the scriptures, this wrestling with passages um, just makes us, our heads hurt even more because we see how much bigger than our minds you truly are. So would you help us to, to dive into that stretching and that, discomfort that we have when we read the scriptures. Forbid, Lord, that we would ever mute your word, that we wouldn't let it, let it have its full say. May we not deny one side or the other, um, but instead let all the Bible speak to be whole counsel of God people until we grow up into all your fullness. We pray this in Jesus' name, and amen.